What is going on, River House? It's Pastor AJ. I miss you all so much. I'm so happy that the quarantine's starting to lift slowly but surely. You know, the extrovert in me is uh, ready to be with people. I'm ready to be with you all in church. I'm ready to to talk with you, to hug you, to sing with you. I, I find myself so often in, uh, during my day just thinking, like, wow, God, it is going to be so powerful when we get all back together. Like, it's powerful now. One of my favorite things about this season, actually, is just, like, how I feel so united to all of you, with you as a church, even though we're not even seeing each other. I just feel like there's this spirit of unity that, that is happening amongst us as we're all going through this beautiful, beautiful season, this, this new rhythm of life, being discipled by Jesus. It's just been so powerful. Uh, but, you know, there's obviously been the challenges of the stay-at-home order. Uh, being quarantined, it's been hard for me as an extrovert. I feel like I'm starting to lose my marbles a little bit. Uh, my wife's thankful, though, because I, I finally started doing work around the house because <laughs> I just got all this extra time. But for her, you know, uh, as an introvert, life is, life is as is. It's normal. It's like it's always been. But I am ready, so, so ready to come and be with you all and worship in church together. I just... I seriously cannot wait. I feel like I can already hear your, all of our voices just singing and praising and honoring him uh, for getting, getting us through this season. Yeah, so I just, I miss you. That moral of the story, I miss you. I miss you so much. And I'm just giving you a big old virtual hug and just say I cannot wait to see you at church. And I just pray blessings over you. Um, but I am so fired up and excited uh, for the word that I, I feel like the Lord gave me for today. I, I truly feel um, that this word is, is going to help put language to kind of what, what we're all going through as a church and as a people. And, and one of my favorite things that, that has been going on in this whole quarantine COVID-19 season has been uh, the reality that what is being experienced in our local church as, as River House is also the thing that I feel like I'm hearing from so many other churches around the world. And, and I feel like in some ways it's so beautiful. We can all be connected on, on new and powerful ways because of technology. So I've just been watching so many other churches, sermons and worship sets, and, and it just seems like we are all going through a similar season. And that's a season of exposing. <laughs> God, God is using this season, this, this season of quarantine when we've been, we're, our nation, our world is, is going through this plague. Uh, he, he is using it to expose all these areas in our life that are not yet yielded to him. I, I, I have found myself over and over and over again in this season just convicted and exposed of all these areas that aren't that I have not yielded that I have not given all these high places in my life that I have not been able to see as high places and the reason right cuz cuz I, I I've been praying and I've been like like lord what is it cuz cuz I'm here on Tuesday Thursday morning prayer I'm here on Sundays I'm I'm seeking you every morning I'm waking up and I'm pursuing you and I'm asking you god god will you convict me will you show me any unclean thing in me will you reveal to me all the ways all the areas that I don't have you seated on the throne of my heart and I, like, I pray those prayers. It's not like I'm just praying those prayers for the first time. And I was just telling the Lord, I'm like, why? Like, why haven't you revealed it to me yet? Like, what, like, what is it? And, and he's like, AJ, you've been just going too fast. Like, we in this culture go so fast. We move so quick. And God is exposing like we, the church, I think even in particular, like he's exposing that, that maybe in a lot of ways we aren't so different than culture at times in terms of pace of life. 
and, and the influence that, that even money has on us. I've, I've even found myself in this season, like, realizing, oh, my gosh, like, I have to let go of more control, more of control. So many of these things have been just rooted in my mind as high places, and I haven't even seen it. And just through all of my conversations with you over the phone, just I feel like it's this constant rhythm and this constant thing that I'm hearing from all of us is that it is an exposing time. It's exposing. God is revealing to us that, that we may be workaholics and not even realized it. That we maybe have, money has more of an influence on us than, than we've ever even known. And it is what it is. God is revealing, and I feel like for one of the first time, probably the first time ever in my life, I can say that I, I, I feel like I'm living in biblical times. You know, I, I felt that in my life before when I, I go to these developing nations over, o- overseas to where when I'm living and I'm seeing the miracles and I'm seeing how God moves and you see the suffering, I'm like, wow, I feel like I'm living in Scripture right now. But, but not in America. I, I don't feel like I've ever in America felt that, wow, this is like the Bible. But what we see, like, over and over and over again, all throughout Scripture, is that God would use plagues. He would use natural disasters. He would use famines. He would use exiles. He would use all of these things to expose the brokenness of his people. He would he used the plagues in Israel. He used he used the famine. He used the exiles. He used these natural disasters always throughout scripture to expose to show the people of God where they have stopped listening to his voice. And so part of me in this season is excited. I'm so excited because I'm like, wow, it's hard. It's difficult. Like this is not easy in a lot of ways. But the reality, but, but, but God is making us in this season more like him. And if there is one thing we know, there's one thing that we know from the bottom of our hearts all throughout scripture is that God's plan from day one is that he wants to redeem and reconcile the whole world back into himself. That he wants to use his church. That he wants to use his bride. All from Genesis to the book of Revelations, what we read is about a God who wants to use his people to bring redemption, hope, and reconciliation into this world. And he works all things good for those who love him. So yes, are we in a season of exposing? Yup. Are we in a season where, I, where we're having to repent and we're slowing down and all these areas in our lives, these high places are being revealed? Yes. But I feel like the message isn't the message of, of, oh man, this is a heavy sermon about, about the discipline of the Lord. It's actually, no, this is beautiful that God would care about us so much that he used this, and, and look, I'm not saying that God caused this, this whole plague, this, this virus thing. I, I'm not God. I don't pretend to be. I, never, I don't know how fully how he thinks. All I know is what the Bible says and what the Bible shows. And God, to get the attention of his people all throughout history, natural disasters, pandemics, all these things. And to me, It is now that we get to realize that we are living in a day where God is wanting to get our attention. He wants us to see what he is doing. He is exposing ways we have fallen off so that we fix our eyes back on him. We would develop these new rhythms of life and we would not go back to normal. That this season, it's important. I truly believe the season that we're going in right now as a church is a season that is not just going to have radical implications for our own church, but also for our city and for our nation. 
and for generations and generations to come. This little microscopic virus <laughs> that we can't see with the human eye has turned the world upside down. And the church is now, boom, focused on the one thing. Amen? Forget that none of you are in here. <laughs> But we're going we're gonna to pick up right where we left off last week in, in Hebrews 12. Jordan preached a beautiful, powerful message last week on, on how we are called to be a people of faith. And that the way that we are a people of faith is by giving ourselves as a pen to the greatest author of all. Like, it, it, to give ourselves to the author and the perfecter of our faith, the way that we can be men and women of courage is by yielding completely to him, by putting our faith and our hope and trust in him and just say, God, use me as a vessel. Use me as, as you wish. And it's, it was a powerful sermon. And the author of Hebrews, we, we don't know who it is, but he is writing to a persecuted church. And we know that because in chapter 10, it says that the church was persecuted. And it is to this church that, that, that the writer is encouraging them all throughout the book of Hebrews so far that Jesus is high and seated on the throne, that he is the one that we are to trust, that he is the one that we are to submit to and give our complete selves to. And it is right after he says that he is the author and the perfecter of our faith that he says this. In verse 5, and I'm going to kind of jump around uh, in chapter 12 because it's long, and I just want to highlight certain portions. But in verse 5, listen to this. <laughs> this is great. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my children, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. <laughs> and he blesses, oh, sorry, not blesses, and he punishes each one he accepts as a child. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Skip down to verse 25. He says, be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is an all-consuming fire. Come on. God disciplines us. He sends us through seasons of exposure. Seasons where he reveals and it's convicting. He brings us to repentance and he disciplines us. Because he loves us. He adores us. We are his children. We are his children. And he loves us. And it says, if there's, there's one thing that we can see in this world right now, is that we live in an extremely shakable world. Our world, in a matter of like, a week was flipped upside down. The economies turned sideways. People lost their jobs left and right. The whole world just shut down because of a microscopic thing, not a, seen by the human eye. Like this world is shakable. It is fleeting. It will not last. 
And what this scripture is saying is that all the shaking, all the conviction, all the challenges and exposure that are happening right now in this world, and and, and all the shaking that has happened throughout history has been because God loves us. God cares about us. That he wants every single thing in our life that does not belong to him. Everything that is shakable, he wants it to crumble and he wants it to fall so that the one thing would remain is the unshakable kingdom of God. (laughs) The one thing remains is an unshakable joy. The kingdom of God is a life of the Holy Spirit in righteousness, joy, and peace. God brings shaking and he allows shaking to happen in the world and in this earth because every unclean thing, every high thing that we have in our life, he wants completely destroyed, not because he wants to punish us, but because he wants us to live in the righteousness, the peace and the joy of the Holy Spirit, the things in life that are completely and utterly unshakable. The kingdom of God is unshakable. And I truly believe that we as Christians as people who are disciples of Jesus, disciples of Yahweh, we have a choice. (laughs) We have a decision each and every day. But they seem more extreme in these times. We have a choice. Are we going to be citizens? Because we do have dual citizenship. We are citizens of this world. And we are also citizens of an unshakable kingdom in heaven. And this kingdom is a kingdom that has always been there and always will be there. It is perfect. It is full of life. It is full of peace. There is healing. There is joy. There is, there is a love that is unshakable, that is never ending, that is never ceasing. And we have a choice as believers to live <laughs> with the mindset to live and the culturization, if that's even a word, of a very shakable earth. We can choose to trust things of this earth. Or we can choose to allow God and just say, Lord, (laughs) will you please convict me? Will you please discipline me? Because I want any, anything that is unshakable in me. Sorry, everything that is shakable in me. I want it to perish. I want it to die. Because the one thing that I want to remain for all of eternity, the one thing is I want to live each and every moment of my day in a kingdom that is everlasting, in a kingdom that is filled with abundant life. And so in seasons like this, where God is exposing, we should be the first ones as the church to be like, let's embrace this season. Let's embrace all of it. Each moment. Let's embrace the slowing down. Let's embrace. Let's embrace maybe the heavier sermons. I don't know. Let's embrace it all. Because God is shaking this earth right now. He is shaking us so that all things would pass away except for the truth and the reality of his unshakable kingdom. He wants to show us what it looks like, what it looks like to truly live a life being more than conquerors. He wants to show us what it looks like to live with a perspective of true joy, of true peace, of true righteousness. 
like, I don't know if you're anything like me, but, but my hope and my peace and my joy can be very temperamental. It can be very temperamental. One day, I can be completely filled with joy overflowing, living in the kingdom of God, living with this joy that is abounding, and then the next day, whamp, just fall flat. And that's because I still have so many things in me that are reliant on things of this world and in this world. And my prayer has been in this season, God, do everything that you need to do in my life. Do everything that you need to do in River House's life. Do whatever you need to do right now because we are more than conquerors. We, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. You will work all things good for those who love them. This is a kingdom that will not fade. Romans 8 says, so then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children of God, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. (laughs) Jesus paid away for us to live in this unshakable kingdom. This kingdom that does not crumble, that has already won, that has always been and always will be. He he died and he resurrected from the grave so that me and you could live in a pounding joy, in a pounding hope, in a pounding life and an abounding peace. We have a choice to live in the flesh in a very shakable kingdom or to live a life of the spirit of the unshakable kingdom. God's plan from the beginning God's plan from the beginning has been that we would be a people who listen to his voice. What did the author of Hebrews say? He says, be careful. Do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. Do not refuse to listen to the one whose voice, who's seated in heaven, is speaking to you. Why? Because God is speaking to us always, telling us what it means and how we can abide in his presence and live in fellowship and communion with him each and every moment of our lives. But when we refuse to listen, when we refuse to listen, is usually when the shaking occurs because he's trying to get our attention again. That's what we see all throughout the Old Testament, right? 
What do we see? We in, in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, it's right after the Israelites have been freed from Egypt. And God speaks to Moses and he says to them, I'm gonna paraphrase because I don't I don't have it exactly in front of me. But he says, Listen to me, obey my commandments, follow me, and I will teach you how to remain free of the diseases that were afflicted on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. Listen to me, obey me, follow me. Listen to my commandments, and you will remain free from the diseases that were afflicted on the Egyptians. I am the Lord, your healer. We as Christians, when we hear that the Lord is our healer, <laughs> I'm so guilty of this. It's the belief. It's, it's the fundamental idea that, oh, someone is sick, so I'm going to pray healing over them so that they could be instantaneously healed. And yes, that is true. And yes, we see that in Scripture. But I believe even more so what that Scripture shows is that God actually wants to teach us a lifestyle of health so that we live in this unshakable kingdom each and every day, a kingdom that is fully healthy, a kingdom that is full of life, a kingdom that does not have disease, that does not have suffering. That's why he says, obey me. Listen to me. Listen to my voice. If you listen to me, you will live in the reality of what I paid for. <laughs> I don't think the Lord sits up there in heaven and gets excited about disciplining us. But he does it because we don't listen. And that's how come in this season, I feel like every all the people that I've talked to in myself, all the exposure, all the things that God is exposing in us <laughs> is around the things keeping us from the secret place is the thing keeping us from the abiding place. Because as soon as we stop listening to his voice, is when we start becoming reliant on things of this world. And so God has beautifully used this pandemic, used this plague. <laughs> he has used it to bring conviction to us so that we are slowing down and spending extended periods of time with them. And he's teaching us how to abide in a deeper, more intimate way. But we have to listen to him. We have to listen. Because soon as we stop listening, if we want to stay away from the shakings, which I think all of us do, right? All of us want to stay away from the shakings. Then we need to listen to his voice. As soon as Israel stopped listening to his voice is when exile came, is when pandemics came, is when all this stuff came. Why? Because they, followed, they, they, they got out of the grace of what God was doing. God purchased a price so that we could have dual citizenship. And we have to learn about this kingdom. Listen to his voice so that we can be his agents of change. Because from the beginning of time, his goal ever since sin entered this world, his heart has been that he would redeem all things. Right, Romans 8 says, all of creation is yearning and groaning for the revelation of the sons and daughters of God. 
This world is longing, is yearning for the church, for the bride of Christ to resurrect and become who they were meant to be. Because the, my old professor, he wrote this down. He spoke this to me when, when I was in college, and he actually posted it on his Facebook this week, and I just thought it was so fitting. It says that the role of the church is to partner with the Holy Spirit as part of the kingdom of God to redeem all things, primarily by worship, which aligns itself to God, and by disciple-making in the manner of Jesus, immersing people, regardless of what they believe in the moment, in the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God wants to heal our land. He wants to heal us. He wants to redeem us. And I think we as the church often think that we, the church, are the kingdom of God. No, no, no. The kingdom of God has been there from day one. And the kingdom of God will advance whether the church partakes or not. But God's choice, he chose to use a rich and glorious bride, a bride that is beautiful, a bride that is filled with hope, living in an unshakable kingdom to bring about reconciliation and redemption in this world. That is his heart. That is his plan. Is to use me and you to bring out that change, to be the ministers of hope. Now more than ever, we live in a world that needs the message of hope. People are freaking out. They are besides themselves. And what better opportunity does the church of Christ have to represent the unshakable attributes of the kingdom of God in the midst of a pandemic? like an unshakable love, an unshakable hope, an unshakable peace. (laughs) The time is now for us to embrace that kingdom, to allow the Lord to discipline us in joy and receive it and beg for it and long for him to discipline us. Remember, it is an encouraging word, as the author of Hebrews says. Because 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. (laughs) That is revival. You know, Most people know that verse in 2 Chronicles. But what I found interesting this week, as I was studying, I've known that verse, I've read that verse, I've claimed that verse. Right before that, it again talks about the need for the people of God to pray and seek his face and obey him and humble themselves. Because if they don't, shaking will happen in this world. Pandemics will come. All these things will come. But he wants to heal our land. That is revival. (laughs) Revival is that God, he wants to teach us a lifestyle of health. He wants to teach us how to be healthy. He wants to teach us, teach us, teach us. But he wants us to humble ourselves, seek his face, and pray to see the kingdom of God come. To bring out the inauguration of a new day. I believe with every fiber of my being that God right now is preparing us as a church. He's preparing us as a people for a move of God. I believe it. I believe that he wants to do a mighty work in you. He wants to do a mighty work in me. And so let's be a people who humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and keep going on and in joy and in kindness and with love be like Lord please convict me convict me of all my brokenness convict me of all my pride because I want only your kingdom to last because he will heal our land 
I'm reading about the Welsh revival. I read about it this week, finished the book. The Welsh and the Azusa Street Revival. (laughs) God poured out his spirit so much in Wales. That soccer stadiums, professional soccer stadiums that had thousands and thousands of people in it were shut down. Not because of a plague, not because of a virus, but because the soccer players who were getting paid money to entertain people got so filled with the Holy Spirit that they would rather be in church seeking his face than be in a soccer stadium. <laughs> what, if, what if the next move of God... <laughs> Was, was like that, that the athletes, that the people all around this world, that, that the entertainers, that politicians, that, that, that we, the church, that we would rather be in the temple of God seeking his face above all else than be entertained. Those things aren't inherently bad. Don't get me wrong. I love me the Lakers and the Dodgers and all those things. But God healed that land so much that millions and millions of dollars, well, maybe not millions back then then, because it was 1906 or whatever it was, but a lot of money was just not happening because people would rather be in church. Crime rate in the town literally almost went to zero where police officers, instead of having their daily duties, would just go to church and pray because they didn't have to worry because no crimes were happening. Why? Because the people humbled themselves. They allowed the Lord to convict them. They embraced the season of conviction. A bunch, if God could do that with a bunch of 16 to 23-year-olds, what could he do with us? No revival ever started without prayer. No revival ever started without repentance. Revival isn't just something that, that, that snaps and happens. A move of the Spirit is not just something that snaps and happens. It's when a people prepare themselves for a move of God. <laughs> it's when a people humble themselves and say, God, do whatever you want in me. Heal. Get rid of every unclean thing. And I have been, I have never in my life been so passionate and hungry to see a move of God. Once you experience how incredibly shakable this world is, like we have the last two months, we, we, even us Christians, we've always known the only hope is Jesus. But now more than ever do we realize that Jesus is the hope of this world, that Jesus is the author and the perfecter of this world. And that this whole world needs him. And so let's embrace this season. Embrace it. Love it. (laughs) I still laugh all the time reading that Hebrews 12. That writer was savage, man. He says, I want to remind you of the encouraging word from the Lord. Embrace the discipline of God. But it's because he cares. And I know I'm repetitive, but I really feel like it's important to put language to what God is doing in our house right now. To what he's doing in this world. Because I I just don't believe that this is only happening at River House. I believe this is happening corporately. It's happening all over that God is trying to get us to slow down. And I I keep, as you know, I've told you I'm an extrovert and I miss people (laughs) so much. I keep finding myself saying, I just want to go back to normal. I just want to go back to normal. I felt like the Lord said to me the other day, AJ, I don't want you to go back to normal. Why would you want to go back to normal? Of course, he wants us to have church together. Of course, he wants us to commune and have fellowship and gather and us have jobs and, and like, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. But our rhythm, our, our style of life, our abiding, he doesn't want us to go back to the busyness and the rushing because he loves us. 
cares for us. So much so that he got our attention. He got our attention. So let's embrace the season, church. Let's take it moment by moment. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be pretty. But we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We are. We are more than conquerors in him. We are promised inheritance. We are promised a joy that will never leave. We are promised an unshakable hope, an unshakable peace. And I don't know about you, but I'm so over wavering from peace to not peace. I'm like, Lord, to strip it all till I have peace. Peace is my normal. Joy is my normal. Hope is my normal. I want it all stripped. We want to see your kingdom come. We want to see a move, Lord, like you did in the Welsh Revival and you did in Azusa Street. Let's prepare ourselves. I encourage you this week to rejoice and to give thanks for our God who is an all-consuming fire. Take time and thank him. It's truly been amazing. Honestly, you guys, I've always viewed the discipline of the Lord as this really heavy, difficult topic. And, and, it, and it is not easy, but even this week, after reading the scripture where it says, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe for our God is a devouring, all-consuming fire. So let's be thankful that he's doing this. Let's be thankful that he's exposing areas in our heart that aren't yielded to him. And allow him to burn it all up. Allow him to be that devouring fire that he is. So Jesus, we love you. I thank you for Riverhouse Church. I thank you, God, that you would so love us that you would pave a way for us to live in a kingdom that has always been and always will be. We give you worship. We give you honor. We give you praise and glory and honor for being the mighty king who defeated death forever so that we get to live in the reality of a kingdom that is the same yesterday, today, and will forever be. I ask for peace and joy <laughs> to just overflow in the homes of our church. I ask for your righteousness to be tangibly experienced. And God, we say yes. We say yes to preparing our hearts for a great move of God that you're going to do in this world. And we just say, we will be ready. We will be found waiting. And we ask God that you would choose us. We love you, Jesus. We honor you. In your name, amen. River House, I miss you. I love you. Be encouraged this week. We'll see you at Tuesday and Thursday morning prayer, and all the devotionals that are coming this week. May God bless you. May his favor and face shine upon you. Have a good rest of your week.